Hello, good morning. Nice to see you again. Thank you for being on time. I had prepared a whole spiel in case I only had 12 students in the room. And I was going to start with, hi, my name is Professor Jesus Christ, and you are my 12 apostles of cinema. I leave you this course. I give you this course. Every time you watch a film, you will remember my words. Anyway, today I'm going to provide a clarification about this week's assignment, which, by the way, now has a new deadline, an extended deadline. I will then offer a summary of some important themes and stylistic patterns for this week's film, Mad Max Fury Road. And then, during the second half of the class, we will engage in an activity that hopefully will let you have a better idea of the format of the final exam and what is required, what is expected of you during that test, okay? So, I have posted an announcement and made all the necessary modifications, I hope, to remove all the contradictions and, of course, I offered some contradictions myself on Monday when I mentioned that this week's assignment would be the last view in notes. I was wrong, had too much coffee in the morning, caffeine-induced agitation does that to me, makes me unfocused. This week's assignment is the last, third and last film essay on Mad Max Fury Road, the last set of viewing notes will be the one you will offer to me on next week's film Green Book. And as I mentioned before, I moved the deadline for this film essay up to the end of Monday, April 24th, for a simple reason. Usually, I review and grade your assignments on Saturday morning so that I'm done by lunchtime and I can enjoy the rest of the weekend. This Saturday, instead, I will be on campus for the second Admitted Students Day of this year. I'll be here until the afternoon. And the next time that I have available on my agenda to correct the assignment will be Tuesday. So that's why I don't have any issues with you taking up to the end of Monday, April 24th. Of course, if you yourself have a routine whereby you finish this by Friday afternoon, etc., you can very well, when you're done before the deadline, if you're done before the deadline, Add a comment inside your Google Docs file saying, I'm done, professor, whenever you want to review, review and grade this, you can go ahead. I will receive a notification from the server and I might be able to correct some assignments before Tuesday. Okay, so film essay on Mad Max. There are instructions, meaning that it shouldn't be generic, but you find here suggestions. You don't have to go through the whole series of points, the whole list, because otherwise your essay might be superficial while you're trying to provide an exhaustive treatment of all these points. You can focus even just on a couple of these points, okay? But make sure, since it is an essay, you strive for analytical depth rather than trying to expand your scope to include a lot of scenes, a lot of examples in this film, okay? So make good use of these points, but don't let these points, these focus points, force you into a structure that is, is not convenient for you, does not help you uh, produce something with good quality, okay? And of course, for this film, you have, as usual, 
a series of reviews, readings, and in lieu of notes, you have two pages where I included a series of frames, just selections of frames from the film with captions and you can just read quickly, look at the captions and get ideas. I didn't cover the whole film, of course. I limited myself to the first part of the first chase from the start to uh, the beginning of the first chase sequence. But you'll find here ideas on how to approach the analysis or the visual cues and the style of this film. Today, I will just summarize some basic ideas because I feel that although I, I love this film every time I watch it, I love it more. I love long, complicated films as they used to do more of in the 1960s and 70s, and someone has tried to repropose that model, Tarantino with Once Upon in Hollywood and Django, for example. But the film can be chaotic. It is chaotic in terms of sound, in terms of speed and action. But especially if you have never seen any of the previous films, even though they're not entirely consistent. If you haven't seen any of the previous films, then the, the story itself might be hard to make sense of. And so I thought one way of providing order and structure is to look at the different spaces, at the way the cosm of the universe, the world of this film, is organized, and of course, every film, every work of art, will go through a process of reduction, whereby the whole universe, the whole world, is reduced to scenes, locations, that represent the larger universe, right? In this case, we can call them microcosms, because they, they include a lot of the essential elements of this kind of post-apocalyptic uh, universe in ways that make the representation of future society better understood. And first, among those microcosms, I put, of course, the desert, because it is there, looking down on a desert plain that we find Mad Max at the beginning of the film where he's standing by his car and then we see the two-headed lizard and then she moves on the ground and he captures her and then he turns and you see the tail of the lizard that he has just eaten to get much needed and rarely available protein. Inside the desert, you find different locales. And the first locale, which I marked with the letter A to proceed alphabetically, just that, you can ignore it, is the small world. You can call it a state, but it's more than that, led by this cruel dictator called Immortan Joe. Inside Immortan's world, indirectly or directly under his control, you find first and foremost the Citadel, and in fact Mad Max, right after the first scene, is chased by the war boys, captured by them, and taken to the Citadel, well, where precise instructions on the use of his body fluids will be tattooed on his back. But inside the citadel itself, you can clearly identify 
different levels in terms of the vertical development and different places in terms of the horizontal placement. First of all, you have two rocks, right? You have these two towers, natural towers. One, we can call it Immortan's Rock because in there you find the quarters, the place inhabited by Immortan and by his stupid son, Rictus Erectus. That's also the place of the power exerted by Immortan, and that power is connected initially in an initial scene to the fact that inside that rock you find both the pipes and the control, these huge gears planted on rocks of water, water that is properly, aptly renamed aqua cola because it's the drink of the masses, right? Of course, when we talk about the quarters of Immortan and Rictus, we see also that there are their servants, for example, war boys and women, war pups, actually, and women, the, the, the child, the children, the, the child version of the war boys, and bodyguards, and the bodyguards you find there are healthier than the war boys. They're not painted in white. They're kind of a special guard. Right? Inside the citadel, during the establishing scenes of the beginning of the film, you also see women producing milk. And the milk is being drank, used by Immortan and his son as a kind of medication, right? To compensate for their lack of health. And then a different group of women, right? And they're different even physically. No one can ignore that. There is the vault where behind this door, like the door of a bank's vault, the breeders, the healthy, beautiful wives of Immortan live together with their keeper, this old woman who is left behind, is wounded, will be taken by Immortan on the chase. Now, the environment they live in is also quite interesting in terms of the symbolic significance of the various props, the various elements of the scene design. You find there a, a fountain of sorts in the middle, so they have access to water, right, to wash and to drink. But more importantly, you find plenty of books on the walls of this kind of circular space. You find a piano, right? And you find chairs lined up in front of what might be a screen. So the breeders are also clearly more intellectually developed than Immortan or let alone his son. Right before the vault, you see when Immortan is walking to check whether the breeders are there, and in fact they're not, they've left behind two writing. One is, who killed the world? And the other says, our babies, our children will not be warlords. He goes through a, green, a, a greenhouse. So there is a vegetable garden inside, and then there is one, another vegetable garden on top of the rock because produce, milk, water are the uh, material possessions that Immortan Joe exchanges with the nearby communities to get what he needs to maintain his power, that is to say gasoline, G-U-Z-Z-O, etc., and bullets. Okay. Next to the rock, the tower where Immortan lives, you find another rock that I called the War Rock, because that's where the white, 
white painted war boys live together with the war pups and you find their, their military vehicles stored inside this rock. You find in there as Mad Max will see because Mad Max Mad Max's body, human body is being modified with this tattoo uh, that shows the qualities of his crazy blood. High octane blood because there is a constant mix in the language of technology and biology. But then when he escapes, he goes through another cave and he finds his own car being modified and he complains about that. And later on, he will complain when he's uh, uh, chained uh, to the perch in front of Nox's car. He will see his modified car driving with the whole fleet of vehicles chasing the rig driven by Imperator Furiosa, and he will say, you wanted my blood, and, and that wasn't enough. You also took, you took my blood, you took my car. So clearly there is this idea that the technology is an extension of the biology, and, and that becomes quite literal in the case of the prosthetic arm, the left arm of Furiosa. We find there an infirmary. That's where uh, Mad Max and other captured prisoners or slaves are used as human blood bags, and that's a, a quote from the film, to uh, uh, restore, at least partially, the health, the frailing health of the half-lives of the uh, sick war boys. You find an altar, because in one of the examples of this, of this mix of natural, historical, and post-apocalyptic, technological, uh, the god, one of the gods of the war boys is called V8, like a V-shaped eight-cylinder engine, which is one of the most famous, successful formulae of engineering for engines of the 20th century. Now they do fewer of them, but if you win the lottery, I would recommend sticking with a Ferrari 458 or 488 instead of going with the hybrid. And the altar is surrounded by steering wheels, which are then taken and raised like the Eucharist, right? You, you cannot ignore the, the, the analogy and similarity. And on top of the second rock, there is more green. You see that in the wide shots. Then there is the lower area at the bottom, at the feet of the rocks. This is where the poor people uh, that are dirty, old, uh, sick, uh, malnourished live. And, and those are the people who observe, one of them is observing with a binocular uh, the moment uh, Immortan will release the water on them and then they're trying to collect as much water as possible and we know there is an underground because we know that the water comes from underground and the idea of the underground world is developed even more in Mad Max and the Thunderdome uh, which is, is one of the prequels I would recommend if you're interested Okay, that was the Citadel we know that outside the citadel, almost in view of the citadel, if you have a telescope, there are two additional communities that are not directly under the authority of Immortan, but they do business trades with him and their allies because they will send vehicles to participate in the chase. And those communities are Gastown, which is, in fact, we can see it on the horizon when Furiosa is driving out of the citadel. Gastown is a refinery. And the Bullet Farm, which we don't see, but we know that they produce weapons. And uh, again, notice in the language the mix of natural and industrial, instead of calling it 
the bullet factory, they call it a farm, as if you grew bullets instead of producing them. Now, all these places are within a few miles from each other, right? We can imagine something like an hour radius, a few tens of miles. But then outside of that, where the rig driven by Furiosa takes a deviation, we find what is defined the hostile territory. And true to its name, we find there first this Russian-speaking uh, uh, tribe uh, which uh, likes a lot to sport uh, vehicles with, with thorns, with spikes, like porcupines. And they're called the buzzards. And then, farther away, you find the canyon with another group, which if you look at the features of the scene, the way they look down, the way they go down, the way they uh, fight, are cinematically reminiscent of the representation of Native Americans in a lot of Western movies from the 1950s. Farther away from the citadel, past the hostile territory, past the canyon, is the unknown. And the unknown is a place that no one has traveled to among the characters in the film. And there you find a desert with a single tree, but later on you find the marshes, and that's the place where the crows or crowfishers live, the people walking with sticks. Right, with, with four sticks. And later on, spoiler alert, later on we learn that in fact these uh, smelly marshes used to be the green place. Used to be this uh, mythical, legendary place where nature was still healthy enough to produce green vegetables and sustain life, produce a sustainable life support a sustainable life. Past the marshes, you find the place of the Vovalinis, the many mothers, which used to be home to Furios, Furiosa's mother herself. And, and of course, even there, complete uh, decay. Uh, uh, the place has become a desert, has become unlivable, and the many mothers then are all too happy to leave leave uh, with, with Furiosa initially on a bunch of motorcycles trying to go through the salt, the salty area uh, where they hope to travel for 160 days to get to the other side. And that is, of course, a, a, a reference to the fact that where used to be an ocean, now you just have a desert with salt left when the water evaporated, and on the other side, there might be another continent and perhaps the possibility of green places, but we don't know that because Mad Max will chase after, run after the many mothers and Furiosa, stop them, and come up with, explain his plan to go back to the citadel. So those are the places, and each place is associated with a different hierarchy, a social hierarchy, but even the vehicles, especially the rig, is kind of a small community, developing relationships. And each place is connected to a different part of the film. The Citadel, of course, will appear twice, and each part of the film has its own style, different themes, and a different kind of atmosphere. What are the themes in, in terms of the development of the narrative? How, what, what, what is the narrative pointing at for you, the story itself? Well, one of the key ideas that you find mentioned in the script 
within the lines uttered by the characters. But if you're not careful, you, you might miss its relevance is the contrast between redemption and freedom. Because clearly this is a world with oppressive tyrannical powers and enslavement is a problem for Mad Max, for Furiosa, for the beautiful breeders, etc. So it's easy to see freedom as a theme, but then there are corrections to this provided by Mad Max and by the story of Furiosa, the idea that freedom is not enough, that being free without a plan is nothing, right? A plan for the future, for a future society. Furthermore, more importantly, being free on the exterior, looking at the circumstances of your life, doesn't make you free inside. In order to be free inside, free from your ha haunting memories, Mad Max Furiosa herself, she was kidnapped, etc. In order to be free from your inner demons, the outside demons, immortal, etc., can be defeated more easily, but your inner demons have to be dealt with with some kind of redeeming action or mission, which will become, during the second half of the film, the mission undertaken by Mad Max and Furiosa. In the second part of the film, Mad Max goes from just being a pirate, a nomad, to being a friendly, to being an ally, right, an accomplice. So both Furiosa and Mad Max need to find their redemption inside to be at peace with themselves and freedom enough freeing themselves from their chains will not do enough for them. Of course, another important theme is society, restoring the bonds of society in a correct way, connecting, which for this film is a lot about being seen. I see you and acknowledging the other's existence and values. And from the beginning, right, uh, Mad Max is chained in front of this vehicle driven by warboy Nooks, and he drives alongside the rig, and Furiosa looks at him, they look at each other, and that's the beginning of an understanding. Then they found themselves in the desert when the rig, after the storm, the sandstorm, is, is stuck in the ground, and again they look at each other, although in a more hostile way, etc. Of course, that one can look in terms of themes at the idea that you find permeating the story of recreating foundations, the foundation of the new world, the foundations of the future, right? And one thing that is conveyed by the brides, by the wives of Immortan is this idea, no to violence, okay? Let's reject violence, that's a foundation for the future. Health, of course, but health means equitable access to resources, sharing of resources. And then finally, and I put it final because otherwise you would get a simplistic view of the film, hope. Hope means going back to a new home because the hope of going home is shattered. Furiosa thinks she can go home to the many mothers, but their world itself is crumbling. Is, is nowhere to be called home. And Mad Max is traveling through this entire world, trying to find a place he can call home, but he will continue on his journey. He will refuse to, to, to stay in the citadel. So going home is, in fact, finding or building a new home. Okay? And in terms of style, I've already said how each segment has a different style, even in a different sound, right? There is the fury, the cacophony of the first chase, and then after the storm, the quiet, but it, it's also a tense kind of silence of the nocturnal chase, and then the silence of the place of the many mothers. Over and over again, you're exposed to this mixing of old and new, which I called artisanal and industrial. The fact that these are industrial vehicles, but they're modified artisanally, and they're also made, their industrial products look to me, 
made to look like animals, like medieval uh, torture uh, vehicles, instruments, etc. The mix of biological and industrial, you can see the, the body and the additions to the body, the breathing apparatus, the prosthetic arm, etc. Finally, I don't know if you've noticed it, and it's also found in some of the Western movies, constantly in the editing, the characters see something happening first, anticipate what will be happening by turning, by looking, and then you see as the viewer what they're looking at. So during the first chase, for example, constantly you see this pattern whereby Furiosa is turning, is looking, looking at the rear view mirror, then you see what, what is going on. It's a new vehicle sent by the buzzards with a rotating saw, with uh, a, a mechanical arm, etc. So look at this, keep this in mind, and then you'll be able to see it every time. First, you see the characters seeing something. Then you see what they are seeing. Okay? That was it. Now, for the final exam, keep in mind you have a page with a short list which is linked. You find the link to this in the syllabus at the bottom of pages for the last few weeks, etc. Use this to prepare for the exam. There you find the description of the exam. You find the short list comprising four films. For each film, I placed the readings you should review. And of course, inside some of the readings, week three, you might find links to other PDFs, etc. Links you should review uh, uh, before the exam. And later on, soon, I will also add the YouTube videos related to these films, the link to those videos. So if you want to watch those videos again, uh, you can do this. And this can become the hub for your preparation for the exam. The second film is also a pass, so the third, a man and a woman, and drive is the last one. As I said, three of these four films will be picked for the exam, and I'm going to give you an example of what will happen after that. So I'm circulating these, which we'll, we'll use for a short activity. The attendance went, went around already. Thank you. In order to demo the format of the exam, I'm not going to use a scene from any of these films. I'll pick another film that I could have included in here, which is Ituma Tambien. So imagine that this is the sad day of the exam. People are crying, they're pulling their air. And after the first five minutes, during the first five minutes, you will just look at the instructions for the exam, including summaries. As I said, I will include descriptive summaries with the names of the characters of each film. This way, the first five minutes, I don't show you anything. I let you review those summaries and prepare for the first film. Prepare mentally, because you know from the summary which scene it is. So you prepare, meaning what can I take from the sequence that will be shown. What details do I need to write down in my notes to use in my response, okay? So imagine these five minutes have gone by, you're calm now, and you're ready, and I offer you the first sequence of three, which will be five, 10 minutes. And after each sequence, I give you 25 minutes or so to write your response so that by the end, you have 30 minutes or less for the sequences and 30 minutes per question to answer, okay? And so imagine this is the sequence that you see in class and that you should comment on. And, and after that, we will do, we'll not write the responses, right? We don't have that much time here. What I would like you to have so that I can give you feedback when I look at your pages, is the following. After you've watched the scene, put down ideas on your page. And during the scene as well, right? You can use this as, as a 
draft as, as a brainstorming uh, uh, vehicle as well. But what I would like you to, to put there and mark in some ways is what would you include in your response, in your short exam essay about this scene, right? So that I can tell you, yes, you have a good list, and if you develop these points, you would have a beautiful grade. Or I can tell you, this is not exactly the kind of thing that I had in mind. Because the idea is for you to write things that are specific to the scene, and then connect the scene to the rest of the film, or perhaps even briefly to another film, okay? So this is a good example of a sequence that I would pick for the final exam for you to comment on, one of the three, okay? And this would be your sequence. And now you have 10 minutes. Now, during the exam, you would have, as I said, about 30 minutes per sequence to develop your response. But this is your opportunity to write down some notes, an outline, if you can, the list of the topics you would include or the examples from the scene or the film that you would touch upon so that I can tell you, yes, this is a good plan and you should do the same during the exam or you haven't understood the idea of the exam very well, let me give you some prompts, okay? So try to do that for this sequence. And then uh, when, when, you, when you're done, uh, at, the, at the end of the class, leave the page, make sure you put your name, and I will return that on Monday or Wednesday of next week with my comments, okay?